Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So welcome to this session. This is the only um, panel discussion session of the summit. It's called Data Challenges and Opportunities in the Next Decade, but I, w I emphasize to the panelists that they are not restricted to just talk about big data, but in fact anything about machine learning where big data may play an important role. Um, and in fact, to take a step back and look at the future, look at the next 10 or 15 years. Um, the format of the panel is that we have four panelists. Each is going to speak for exactly five minutes. <laughs> and then we will uh, have about 15 or 20 minutes to have the panelists uh, uh, ask uh, and, uh, questions of each other. And then we'll have about 15 or 20 minutes to have questions and answers from the audience. So I'm going to, in order to save time, because I know some of you are pressed for time to, to leave early, um, I'm going to introduce all the panelists at once. Um, before I do that, let me just share with you the three questions I asked the panelists to think about. And I would like to ask the audience to think about questions as they're listening to the panelists that you would like to ask them uh, during the Q&A. So our first panelist is sitting to your left. Uh, Michel Cosnard is the chairman and CEO of INRIA. Um, he is uh, his research interests are in algorithms, parallel computing, grid computing, uh, networks of automata, and neurons. Now, all these panelists have multiple awards and honors and titles and so on, so I'm just going to say one or two about each in order, again, to save time. I hope the panelists are not offended. Uh, so, uh, Michelle is a, a won the Charles Babbage Award by uh, IEEE, and he is a Knight of the French Legion of Honor. Wow. <laughs> I want that title. Okay, Lionel Tarasenko is sitting next to Michelle. He is Chair and Professor of Electrical Engineering at Oxford University. His research interests are in signal processing techniques, um, especially as applied to diagnostic systems, for example, for jet engines and health problems. He is a fellow of IEE, and, a and the Royal Academy of Engineering. Um, he received the British Computer Society Medal for work on neural network analysis of sleep disorders. So that's Lionel. Commander uh, of the British Empire. If Michel is Knight of the Legion of Honor, <laughs> I should mention the uh, commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire, CBE. <laughs> <laughs> Next is Ian Book Bucken who is the clinical professor of public health um, informatics at Manchester University. His research interests, I have to read this, uh, you'll understand why later, are very broad, uh, in, in particular in bringing together statistical and mathematics, biomedical, social, economic, and computational thinking to healthcare, especially in epidemiology. He's a fellow of faculty of public health, a fellow of the Royal Statistical Society. And last is Eric Horvitz, who is the managing co-director of the Ma Microsoft Research uh, Lab in Redmond. His research interests are in machine learning and intelligence with links to dec decision sciences, human-computer interaction, biomedical informatics, and information retrieval. He's a fellow of many societies, including having just been elected to the National Academy of Engineering and recently elected to the Chi Academy. So that's Eric. <laughs> So we will start with Michelle, and uh, I forgot to introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Jeanette Wing, I'm head of uh, Microsoft Research International. Okay, so um, uh, data challenges and opportunities in the next decade. So first, I, I just want to, one, one, one or two slides on uh, INRIA, so INRIA is a French institute for research in ICT, and we are doing research, development, education, training, and transfer and innovation. 
and it's uh, rather large institu institution since we have more than 3,500 scientists. So, um, why big data today? So, uh, I, I just want to say again what uh, Rick uh, did in yesterday. So, uh, uh, the, n the overwhelming amount of data generated by all kinds of devices is, is or networks or, 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 or services. So, so it's, uh, it's something that is, is coming, that is present, and, and we have to deal with. Um, and uh, the challenges we, we see with big data is, is, is really scale to, to, to velocity, to speed, uh, because there is a continuous stream uh, of data, heterogeneity and, and also complexity of, of this data. Um, so I was asked an example of machine learning in practice. So uh, I, I would point out one work that has been done at INRIA, there are several uh, on, on search in, in image databases and, and we are now uh, Capable in less than in, in, in a less than one second to to to, to answer a query on on more than uh, 100 million of Im images, and uh, that's uh, clearly a, a, a big change. Uh, opportunities over the coming years. So, uh, of course, uh, the opportunity comes from the difficulty. <laughs> so there will be uh, uh, more and more data, and these data will be uh, richer. Uh, and uh, so uh, just one, two, two, two points that I, I want to, to underline. The linked open data on the web and, um, and the, the data, amount of data generated by all, all kinds of devices uh, in, in what we call Internet of, of uh, so What are the greatest research challenges that, that we, we uh, 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 see? Uh, I just want to, to point one specific do domain is, is to solve the, the two opposite requirements in terms of human workload. So um, uh, we, we need, of course, uh, uh, weekly supervised learning uh, in order to deal with the, the uh, large uh, amount of data. And from the other side, I mean, data is nothing if you cannot transform it into reliable and trustable uh, knowledge. So uh, these uh, reliable and trustable knowledge needs human validation. So, so the, the trade-off is, is uh, how much human knowledge you have to put in, in, in this. And um, three specific uh, domain I, I, I may uh, underline is knowledge discovery, uh, visual analytics and, and, and geometric inference. So one slide on each of them. Uh, in knowledge discovery, uh, we have to, to deal with uh, uh, knowledge representation and, and, and reasoning, and we need uh, work on adapted algorithm for this. In visual exploration of, of big data is, is a big uh, domain, and, and uh, uh, interaction with the, this visualization is, is quite important and new. And uh, also geometric inference and topological data analysis, it's quite very important. So the last word, uh, in, syn in synthesis, big data is not the problem of, of, of the amount of data, is that it's corresponding, in fact, to big challenges. And I, I, we can discuss this later on. Thank you. So I can start whilst Jeanette is uh, loading up the pictures because we are on the tight uh, time scale. Uh, in terms of prediction, I'm with Niels Bohr. Uh, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. So I'm going to talk to you about some of the things we've learned over the last decade, which we'll probably map out onto the next decade. Secondly, I'm an engineer, so I'm passionate about getting real world, non-consumer, and you'll see why non-consumer is different from what I'm calling real world, I hope, by the end of my five minutes. Um, applications of, of machine learning. Comme on dit en français, un dessin vaut mieux qu'un long discours. So a picture is worth a thousand words, and that, I don't know how machine translation would deal with that uh, from the original in French, uh, but I'm going to show you lots of pictures uh, because uh, that means I can say a few words. So I started working Rolls Royce in 97. Uh, on the Trend 500, and we did machine learning for sensor data diffusion. These are the fuel, oil flows, temperature, pressures, vibration sensors on the Trend 500 engine. We analyzed data from the first ever run on the test bed of the Trend 500, uh, as well as the Trend 500, we've done the Trend 900, the Trend 1000, 
Rolls-Royce doesn't care who wins in the aircraft wars between uh, Boeing and Airbus because it supplies engines to both. It supplies the Trent 900 to the Airbus A380 and the Trent 1000 to the Boeing 787, the Dreamliner. So what you see in the middle here is actually the first um, endurance flight uh, to Australia of the Airbus uh, A380 where we analyzed the whole of the data and the whole of the endurance data. So we've built real systems based on machine learning for Rolls-Royce which are used uh, today in, in their uh, various data centers. Um, and in fact, actually, Rolls-Royce don't sell engines. They sell you a to total care package these days because, of course, it's very important for the uh, airplanes to uh, have as few engine failures as possible. Um, and therefore, they have, and they mention here in this uh, advert from Rolls-Royce, half a billion reports being streamed back to the operations center annually. But actually, you'd be surprised how little machine learning there still is uh, in their data center. And the reason why is that in order to do um, uh, machine learning, you need to be able to do, for reasons I can explain in the discussion, you, did, you need to do it on the wing. To do it on the wing, however, you have onerous regulations, whether in US or Europe, um, about actually having algorithms that um, uh, analyze airborne data. And the certification of on-wing software is a lengthy process. We're only in the second iteration of the systems we designed for Rojo. So a key issue, if you want to do machine learning from the lab into the real world applications in this domain is certification. That's also true in the medical area where uh, we've been designing patient mon monitoring systems. Uh, we believe that our system was one of the first, if not the first uh, machine learning application to be approved by the FDA. We had to give three predicate devices to the FDA in order to get that approval. And secondly, to get the alerting software approved, we had to do a clinical trial. So certification in healthcare, whether big data or otherwise, will require um, uh, regulation by the FDA, will probably require clinical trials demonstrating improved patient outcomes. Big data in healthcare, I think two things that perhaps haven't been mentioned very much at this uh, meeting so far is the time scales that you're looking at. Ten orders of magnitude from 10 to the 9, roughly the number of seconds in their lifetime for genomic data, all the way to acute hospital data once per second. In between there, you've got self-monitoring data, and I profoundly disagree with Herman Hauser about what he said in terms of self-monitoring data. We can come back in the discussion. You can ask me why I disagree about what he said on self-monitoring data. Um, very important, been mentioned a few times, maybe it's being slightly forgotten. How do we incorporate prior knowledge into our machine learning algorithms? A couple of examples, very simply. I'm not going to explain this slide. This is the slides of the vital sign, the physiology of the recovering patient after surgery. It happens, it's not the left-hand side that matters, the parameters themselves, but the variability at the right time scale, because it's all about recovering homeostasis after surgery. And that's indicated by whether you remain highly variable or not, or you'll settle down gradually, as in the green tracers, for those who are going to recover and not end up back in intensive care. Uh, Self-monitoring of patients, I'm not going to uh, explain this except the red dot. This is patients we ask to monitor their conditions because they've got a, a, a significant respiratory condition, COPD. We can get false alerts simply because they decide to monitor at a different uh, time of the day than they normally do. Diurnal variations may be bigger. So how do you incorporate that into your machine learning algorithm only by understanding enough of the physiology of the patient. That's, and I think that's something very important and I think we need to focus on the incorporation of prior knowledge into our machine learning algorithms, deal with multiple timescales and if you want to get it out there in the real world, certification is a big issue. Thank you very much. Now I'd like to take a public health perspective and start by asking the question, where does public health and healthcare need machine learning? And point to some hard problems that I don't see addressed at the moment. Big need. Current medical evidence predicts less than a third of what will happen to a patient when treated, or what will happen to the average patient in the average treatment. Consider Mr. Jones over here, type 2 diabetic, high blood pressure, chronic kidney disease, goes to, see the no, goes to see the diabetologist. So the diabetologist focuses on his blood sugar. Focusing on the blood sugar puts up his weight. Putting up his weight 
puts up his blood pressure. Putting up his blood <coughs> pressure puts stress on his kidneys. So he goes to see the nephrologist with advancing kidney disease. The nephrologist focuses on blood pressure control. Two control points. Three different care pathways. One indicating how to control Mr. Smith's weight from family medicine. But Mr. Smith is not the sum of three different sets of guidelines or three different rule bases. He's the union of those highly interacting factors. And the interactions point to two-thirds of the evidence base that's not covering his needs. So, some myths. How do we bridge that two-thirds gap? The ingredients we need are data models and expertise. We have a tsunami of data. We have a blizzard of models and methods and pe through papers in the medical literature, but we have a drought of that precious resource for abstract reasoning, the expertise to build the usefully complex models in the big data. So in the health science community, you could say that big data is the solution is a common myth at the moment. You could also posit that in the context of big data in health science, the idea that science will provide all the models to transform the data is an unrealistic expectation and that clinicians will continue to be the main source of data is also prominent in the mind of many health scientists. Let me give some examples of the myths. So here we have type 2 diabetics. On the vertical axis, we have the blood, red blood cell concentration. People down here are feeling tired uh, because they have anemia. They're feeling miserable and tired with a low red blood cell concentration. This is due to their shrinking kidneys, sending less of a signal to the bone marrow to produce more red blood cells. If we want a large data set to look for this tipping point between shrinking kidneys and reducing red blood cell concentration, we have to get an indication of this kidney function. That is commonly done through a blood test, creatinine, age, and sex. But we don't just need a larger database because the transformation is a nonlinear one with age, sex, and creatinine into estimated glomerular filtration. You need to know the lab assay to get the formula right for the transformation common metadata that are missing from big databases. Borrowing strength, reaching outside science into the data that's being generated increasingly in the service. So this is from a scenario from the world's largest respiratory trial. Here's a drug company. This is GlaxoSmithKline over here, putting forward for testing a new beta agonist combined with steroid to help people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. That's a once a day dose versus a twice a day dose. More convenient business case predicated on that convenience also interacts with the deprivation that the patient experiences. The public health team over here know that the deprivation scores in Salford where this trial is taking place are unreliable. They've recomposed them. Ideally, we'd have an Amazon-like environment where users who selected those data also did these things to them. We'd be able to borrow strength from multiple data transformations touching the same data. People generating data from their own experiences. Here's a trial of an app in schizophrenia to try and reduce the relapse of schizophrenia by giving people a heads up that they're going off their medicines. That interacts with a set of care pathways. But to make this truly engaging and not irritating and switched off, you need an underlying cognitive model. So this is a real application of machine learning with colleagues at Microsoft to some of the data, trying to take an alternative approach to the usual either-or hypothesis-driven or data-driven, to take a hypothesis-shaping approach, to debunk a, common, debunk a common myth. The common myth here was that children were either those with an allergic tendency or those without an allergic tendency. And there are many diagnoses in medicine, for example, asthma. This is not one diagnosis. It's many underlying conditions. So we test the children with a bank of allergens at age 1, 3, 5, and 8. We're trying to infer here with infer.net the probability of gaining or losing sensitization. And by looking for the structure in the data in this reasoned way, we came up with five classes instead of two. Those predominantly non-dust mite, dust mite, multiple late, multiple early sensitizations. Just note that this has an odds ratio of multiple early sensitizations of subsequent development of asthma of around 31. Very large signal in the data was not anticipated at the original stage of hypothecation. So we're shaping hypotheses. So I'll finish by uh, putting forward some challenge areas I see for machine learning to focus on areas of public health need. I could use a portmanteau term here of assisted reasoning. We need machines to infer 
that people are touching data in ways like other people to connect their abstract reasoning, to build those usefully complex models in ways that do not rely on the structure in the data alone. Thus, we get this heuristic in health science to discover those underlying subgroups for more personalized care, those endotypes. We need machines that can give the heads up that someone else is touching the data like you. And not only that these factors that may not be in your shopping basket of data might be relevant to your investigation, but also this type of transformation can add value to your interaction with the data. And that will create a series of usefully complex models. We then need to hinge that useful complexity between the N of one model of my health and how I responded previously and the average patient model, which is the current medical evidence base. Thank you for listening. So I've been reflecting about uh, Jeanette's questions the last uh, couple of days here. Um, I've been particularly excited about, uh, for years now, about systems that are immersed in real-world settings that continue to learn in an automated manner over time, and that not only observe but lean forward using active learning uh, to understand the best way to learn, uh, and they continue to probe at the borders of their own competencies. And this includes work that we're doing where systems are online and reacting to uh, shifting sets of data over time, um, buzzing, adapting, leaning forward. Uh, where most of that work right now is in the lab, but some is out already. We have uh, systems uh, around the world that are doing uh, reasoning and learning in a semi-automated way about patient outcomes. Uh, the nearest by here is Southampton right now, up in Southampton. Uh, uh, this, this is happening as we speak. Some of our traffic prediction work is doing the automatic work. Um, in general, um, having systems that uh, can reason about, to do this, that reason about the perceptual skills and the intellectual skills of both people and machines together, again, it's another challenge area that we're working on in this idea of leaning forward and buzzing. On multiple opportunities ahead over the next decade, I'd like to see us take more seriously decision making in machine learning. And I don't just mean adding a loss function, as some people think decision-making and learning is. It's really deeper integration of action uh, into our models and back propagating that to the methods and the focus of attention of where our algorithms do their work with data. Um, it's great to see Francis Bach here, former intern on our group, one of our best interns of all time. His pro Microsoft research project was learning directly the receiver operator characteristic curve and optimizing the area into the curve directly and propagating the actual effort into the algorithms there. Um, it's also a great opportunity to develop situated autonomous learning systems that continue to adapt and decide about scientific uh, problems um, that help human beings in the broader endeavor of doing science, uh, that even uh, propose and pursue scientific hypotheses that do discovery from multiple data sources and so on. On near-term applications, there's quite a bit to be done on learning about people to support them, to enhance interaction, to complement them in numerous ways. Think about systems that can learn about what we'll remember and forget, what our attentional focus is at any moment, uh, what to display, when we'll be surprised. This is a very rich uh, opportunity area. Now, I thought I'd end with a grand challenge. Um, uh, as a broad and important challenge and set of technologies and principles we need to develop as a community. And I'll allude to the intuitions and passions of a great Swiss-French scientist and a great Parisian of the past, Jean Piaget. There's a great opportunity, and anybody who had kids sees that what we're learning and what our field learns in terms of classifiers and predictions is quite different than what our children learn out of the box or into, the, into life, we'll say, quickly. And there's an opportunity to master uh, methods for moving beyond classification and pushing on likelihoods and inferences about classes to learn about rich, actionable knowledge in the world of interrelated concepts. And this is going to take advances on several fronts, but I see glimmers of directions here in terms of transfer learning, multitask learning, causal inference, and quite likely uh, folding in natural language processing on concepts but powering up an incessive, incessant uh, active learning on a path to learning in a cross-domain manner, leveraging the different domains as language models for one another. 
Now, as a sample direction, I'll stop with here because I want to get more concrete of this grand challenge. How can we move from the current focus on competencies with the task of classifying images in ImageNet, uh, tens of thousands of categories, um, to move beyond ISA hierarchies, to, an, to move beyond inferring maybe objects that might co-occur statistically, to a rich understanding of ontologies of relationships, dependencies, and causation in these images among objects in the scenes. We'll likely have to leverage distinctions and fundamental knowledge about human-centric action, uh, affordances. We'll have to understand the nouns of our world, the verbs, prepositions, the knowledge of, that comes from social relevance and setting, uh, even defined why a picture was taken, what was going on in that scene. There are breakthroughs ahead. I'm optimistic we're going to develop these deeper, more comprehensive, and more holistic learnings about actual knowledge um, across domain. And I think when we get there, when this community gets there, <clears throat> we'll look back upon the last 25 years or even 30 years uh, of work and think a lot of these pieces were enabling, but that really wasn't learning. I'll stop there. So now, can you hear me? Okay, now I'd like to turn to the panelists and ask them if they would like to comment on each other's comments. So we can start with Michelle. Um, I have one question to, to Yonel. Um, you, you, you tackle engineering and health, and uh, in, in both cases, we, we, we can uh, discuss the role of the human in the loop. Uh, if you take the uh, airplane, uh, is it necessary to have a pilot, or, or do, do, we, <laughs> do we need a pilot? And the same for healthcare, I mean, do we still need doctors? <laughs> um, well, as I'm sure you know, a plane that flies from Paris to New York is actually flown uh, by the autopilot for all the flight by about 10 seconds. So, and in fact, it's, it's, it's the very shortly after takeoff, um, the machine takes over from, from the pilot. And although the pilot lands the plane, there's absolutely no reason why the machine couldn't land the plane. So I think it's also to do with uh, human psychology. We've got the Google car which is driverless, we've got um, in Oxford the robot car which is also driverless and um, it's, it's human psychology. How would we feel first being in a car that has no driver? Uh, most of us in the machine learning community would probably be reasonably happy um, as long as we knew what algorithm was being used um, <laughs> to how deep or shallow it was um, to, to, to be in the car. In the plane I think we may still have some reservations but we're people who understand even what the word algorithm means. The general public out there, you know, in terms of the psychology, and that's, that's what I wanted to mention about healthcare. There's not only the patient physiology that matters, but also the patient psychology. Um, because one of the points I was trying to make implicitly is actually we talk about algorithms, we talk about computing resources. The most costly aspect in 10 years from 20 years now will not be the computing platform will not be the time spent uh, developing the algorithm, it'll be actually acquiring the data. Acquiring the data, unless you're looking at, you know, uh, social media applications, the way people interact with technology, but actually in healthcare or even on a plane and so on, acquiring data becomes perhaps the most expensive part of the system. Um, that, that's an aside. In terms of doctors and so on, if you have enough data, then you can make pretty good inferences. But I think we always want to have a safety net. It's a human uh, reaction to know that if something happens, the, the pilot can um, take over from the autopilot. Um, likewise, uh, it is probably true that most machine learning algorithms would do better than the average primary care physician. Uh, but we still need that face-to-face -face interaction uh, in order to be told what's wrong with us. So it's more psychology than else. I'll make one comment about Please do. the idea of the data being expensive. Yes, in a, in a world full of data, we still have the challenge of expensive data and acquiring it, cleaning it, and using it. Uh, I, don't, I hadn't seen very much at all at this meeting on active learning. Um, and when you do see 
active learning at like an ICML meeting, it's often very simplistic. Uh, we just published a paper last night, actually, on the web that looks at active learning as a rich planning problem. And so making our systems aware and even with sparse data, giving them the ability to go out and figure out which data they want to grab given the cost of the data. Mm. In healthcare, for example, very critical, especially if you go back and interview maybe people about what happened in the past. It's not encoded in an EHR. So I think this is a really rich area to push on hard, making our systems aware and active and understanding where to sort of extend their tentacles. Yeah, the information content, the data that you don't have. Right. How do you grab that data? There's a cost in there of good enough modeling. And it's an optimization point between getting an, an accurate measure at one point in time and getting a less accurate measure but more frequently. The, the true utility of longitudinal data has, has not yet been fully exposed. And, and the models to get that optimization. I showed a smartphone app there that had one element of a questionnaire. So there's a trade-off there between asking the, the user to respond to too many elements to the point where it annoys them and they'll turn it off, to having an incomplete response to that psychometric instrument, and then supplement that with, with, with further questioning. Some very complex temporal structure in, in, in that modeling problem. Yes, one of the illusion of, of human and, expert, and especially of expert is that is they, is they, they are trust in themselves that they are right. Uh, when you when you go when you see a pilot or a doctor or any expert, he will tell you this is the truth, and unless another expert says you're not right, and. What a machine a machine is not doing. A machine is just uh, taking one hypothesis among a set and and giving probability to, to this hypothesis. So I think um, that we should overcome this uh, this point. And this is a, 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 this, there will be such a transition in in, in health system. And uh, rather than consulting one specific doctor or surgeon to have a team where uh, uh, team with machine <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, where the patient or the group of patient could have uh, a series of hypotheses on his diagnosis and on the treatment uh, so that he, he, he can choose and um, this is the point I, wa I wanted to I, I have a related question, which ha it has to do with trusting the data. How do we, we are going to be building these applications in safety critical domains like healthcare and jet engines, and, and they're going to be based on analyzing uh, using machine learning and so on, on data. So how, how do you address the trust issue for data? And, and beyond trust, we have applicability. If you, anybody gets a 23andMe study, and you look at the risk factors they'll publish on your, on your single nucleotide polymorphisms, and you go down, they'll, they'll tell you each study they've done and why, and it'll be like an Asian data set which is being used to tell me what my stomach cancer risks are. And they'll just put up a graph and say, this is what we have so far, and, and they'll assume transferability uh, and portability per you to Perl. And so the idea of not even beyond trust, how do we know we have representative data for the situation we care about? Yeah, I mean, I think that there's two things very briefly before we open to, to the audience. I think you're right. A lot of people now go to the doctors still in the UK after they've Googled their symptoms and, and their disease. So, in fact, it's, become, it's the consumer driving it as a consumer of healthcare. So, if you talk to the average primary care physician, the site they hate most is Google because it gives them a lot of difficulties because patients come either with some kind of grand truth or, um, and then the whole consultation is spent trying to say, is the doctor better than Google or vice versa? This is happening more often, but it's driven by, by the consumer in this case, and I think it will happen more. I think what is needed on those, uh, and I don't know if anybody's proposed it, is some kind of external validation of the healthcare information, because there's some good websites. For example, we've got Diabetes. The Diabetes UK website is, is good, but there's plenty of websites that actually tell you 
information which is wrong because it's not regulated. So I think some validation of that information maybe by the experts or some other means would be useful. In terms of trusting the data as well, I think we need to go back to what we're doing in the 70s and 80s, sensor modeling. You know, to trust the data, do you trust the sensor in the first place? And the other one is data fusion. So if you have multiple redundant sensors, if there is a sensor problem, then it'll be very clear that that sensor is giving you erroneous information. So I think sensor modeling and some form of sensor uh, data fusion helps to build confidence in the data. H how about using uh, redundant machine learning algorithms on uh, different algorithms on the same data set? So, so they talk about trusting the algorithm. Mm -hmm. I guess it's, so. So the, 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 there are some methods uh, out of control theory and uh, decision science on stability and robustness. And one way would be to look for sensitivity to things like algorithmic changes and to using different kinds of data. And as you put back on the data or the feature set, how stable are, are the inferences? How deep are you into an action space that's not changing? Um, as you as you change the algorithms or the parameters you, you're using, versus sitting on the edge of a, or a cusp where, as you shift aspects of the analysis or the data, you're changing the recommendation recommended action in the world, and you're not sensitive at that point. And so you know you need to sort of be more careful. I think an inverse problem to, to the trust in in the information and the mechanisms of producing the information is is the public good the contribution of your own data, your personal data, to the public good to shore up some of the weaknesses, particularly in the expensive areas of capture. Um, let me give you a personal example. Um, my, both of my parents have pulmonary fibrosis, and my mum recently died of lung cancer. Now, both in pulmonary fibrosis and lung cancer, there is uncertainty as to whether a food supplement, N-acetylcysteine, is helpful or not. And a lot of physicians around the world will recommend patients. I'll say the trials are equivocal on whether the inflammation that causes pulmonary fibrosis can be dampened by taking N-acetylcysteine. It's not prescribed a lot of the time. The patient's asked to go to the health food shop. There is new biology just come out that um, the end stages of cancer, so-called cachexia, when the body is consuming itself, can be dampened because mitochondria will be inhibited by N-acetylcysteine. So there are natural experiments taking place out there all of the time. And certainly myself and my family would be very grateful if the data of, from, from our family were used, were contributed to the public good. But we need, beyond the clinically coded data, to mobilize public support in those natural experiments. And just as we talk about an instrumented web and future systems that reveal how our data are being used in a very connected way. I think the evolving knowledge that is highly motivating can help uh, mobilize some of that very precious yeah. data capture that Lionel one, referred yeah. to. One, one comment on, on your example is that there's a chasm between the formal clinical trial, which are expensive and you know, you involve small n, and the, and the larger informal uh, platforms like patients like me right now mm -hmm. that are wild west. And uh, what, what I would love to see, and I've spoken to, to Jamie, who founded uh, Patients Like Me, are folks in this community, for example, and people in, in, the, in related clinical communities, working with these scruffier platforms to introduce statistics and methods that can really mine from the larger data sets uh, to, to bridge this uh, shared crowdsourced healthcare data with the formal you know, verified clinical trial. Okay, I think um, I'd like to open up the uh, I'd like to open up to uh, the, the audience now for questions and answers. By the way, it, it, I think it's purely coincidental that three of the four panelists are uh, uh, experts and have interest in healthcare. So I, I don't think we're limited to just talking about healthcare, <laughs> but um, we might as well take advantage of that expertise. So let's start with Rick. Well, actually, I was just going to ask a question that on a different topic, which is I've noticed in several sessions we've talked about uh, applications like healthcare. We, we brought up engineering. You know, um, we haven't really talked about education, but that seems like a place where, where there's a huge opportunity for machine learning 
to be able to build systems that can educate people better than people do, uh, or at least in certain areas do, do a potentially better job by being able to diagnose what individuals know and what individuals don't know, present them with the best possible material. So I'd be curious if the panelists have any, any thoughts about that. We were talking about getting, getting rid of physicians and getting rid of pilots. What, what, what if we get rid of right. teachers? Or at least help them. I mean, I, I, I think the, um, with the work going on in, in online uh, mm. courses and with flipped classrooms is a tremendous opportunity to collect uh, really valuable and large amounts of metadata about uh, the process of learning and education. Um, there's an ongoing discussion about uh, uh, whether or not the various entities like edX and Coursera will be releasing their data, making it available uh, even to the teachers of those classes. And uh, I have to say that I just saw the first paper from, published by Coursera, I think, Andrew Eng and Jonathan Wang and others, one of Daphne's postdocs at Stanford, with very promising results on peer grading and peer assessment from Coursera data. So uh, uh, we're seeing some, uh, some good work in that space starting, I think. It's a great topic area. Uh, yes, I, a, a comment. I mean, um, uh, in, in this type, I mean, in education and, and learning, there is a passive learning and active learning. And uh, of course, for uh, I think for passive learning, I mean, we could do, get rid of the of the the, 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 the professor in, in the. Uh, but for active learning, it, 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 it's quite different uh, because uh, in active learning, you need maybe it could be done by a machine, but it's it's. It's a more clever task because you need to be to be to be correct corrected. Um, uh, so it's the role uh, the role of the of the parents in, in, in the in the in the children education. You know, uh, could could the, could the child be educated only by, by a machine? I don't know. Not but, quite sure. But Michelle, I mean, I mean, the the biggest piece I think of act, the active part of learning is motivation and engagement. Right. We could learn about that. Yeah. Of course. So I, I think obviously the U.S. is leading in this, um, and I have several of my postgrads taking the courses um, f um, at, at some like on Coursera and so on, and, and the experience has been very good. I think what I would say about education, as indeed with healthcare, is a lot of our machine learning is based on population-based models, and one of the things you have to worry about are the tails, and they, there's often uh, something specific about why that person is either doing extremely well or is doing extremely badly and often these models because they're based on large numbers of samples and effectively are modeling the population um, uh, may not be so good so I would say yes let's by all means continue to do this but let's also improve our modeling of the tails because there are some human stories in each case both in disease and in learning uh, both at the top end and the bottom end that may need human intervention to deal with the tail so the large proportion, say, you know, within three standard deviations of the mean either side, uh, will be fine, augmented by occasional human interaction, because you know your fees have got to go somewhere, not just. Uh, um, and I know the fees in the US are probably even higher than the fees in the UK for for education. So uh, there will be some financial argument that, uh, about how interacting with the professors, but I think also the interaction about why it is that those people are in the tails which may not be revealed simply from the online interaction. Let's take another question. So uh, basically carrying on uh, from this sort of point that you made about this black swan effect, right, where you don't see the, the data in the tail. Now, Eric mentioned that there could be a more active learning approach where you actually go and search for that data which is missing. Right? But in certain cases, it might be very difficult to get those examples. Now, if you are a, a training a self-driving car, you need to be able to see what sort of things cause accidents, right? the variability in human behavior, and to basically uh, sort of infer intent of humans. And that seems to be a very, very difficult problem because there's so much variability in those observations. Right? So do you have any sort of thoughts on how one would go about uh, sort of making sure that we can sort of certify that my machine learning system is going to be robust against those sort of uh, observations and those, those sort of phenomena. Well, I, I, mean, I think difficult. I think we're getting to almost the domain of extreme value statistics. So effectively, these are extreme cases. Um, and there's 
two schools of thoughts. You can do extreme value statistics from learning the distribution of normals and studying the tails using Weibull uh, distributions which assumes Gaussians for the normal, or you can throw away everything you know about the normal and concentrate on these very rare events. I tend to be at the latter school because I think, especially in healthcare, there's no reason why the tails are actually anything to do with the normal distribution. So how do you concentrate on those rare events and acquire that data? But I think it is very important because you probably can't infer very much from normal behavior. It's not just uh, you know, the tails of distribution, it is quite a different model altogether. And I think you probably do need to acquire that data passively. I mean, I think in a car it would be reasonably easy to acquire um, black box type data uh, as you do in, in air crashes to try and work out why the rare event has occurred. But I don't think you can infer it from the 99.99% with several nines of the data that you may have in your general model. As a, as a grad student, my second advisor, George Danzig, turned to me, knowing that I was going to get an MD as well as a PhD, and said, um, I was, I've, I've just been told I need to get a cardiac surgery for an aortic valve. Go do a decision analysis for me and let me know what I should do. Should I believe these surgeons that say you need it done immediately? I couldn't find any place where, no one list, where people didn't listen to the doctor, and that was the lore. Everyone got it done immediately. So I had to sort of figure out how to generate those cases and, uh, and, and in the decision analysis. Sometimes the data is not there because of policy. Mm -hmm. So you asked a very hard question. Uh, there's a, a number of ways we could talk offline about dire research directions on that. So. Another question from the audience? Um, a very nice and interesting panel, but the point is that we are talking about machine learning and making machine intelligent and data and all of this. There is two points that I am missing in the discussion. One point is about the fact that with this amount of data and machine becoming intelligent, how can we get around ethics? And how can we get around problems like privacy and problems like, you know, the use of this data? And I think that we have a big challenge as a community of computer scientists that we are not used to have such a power on the life of people to uh, begin also to think about how can we educate ourselves to this kind of philosophical concepts and uh, kind of you know, correct behavior because more power means more responsibility. And uh, that's true with any technology. And it's been true that way for decades and decades and decades as people have innovated and come up with new ideas and technologies that influence society in a variety of ways. My first reaction to your comment is it's a very important comment, uh, but in some ways we want to uh, develop and watch and react and, and with care as we go, as opposed to thinking in advance about all possible ethical issues that might come up. It's going to be an incremental process, I think, with some bumps in the road, for example, in privacy. Eric, with due respect, I, I disagree a little bit. Uh, I think that we are at a point that where technology is now very intrinsically uh, fusion with, with, uh, with uh, humanity, with society. It's no longer, uh, you know, uh, uh, technology for, for engineering. Now no, it, 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 it's, it's changed the society itself. So I think we should change our mind and incorporate these questions by design. So I think that uh, the, the, the system of the futures should incorporate uh, privacy concern, security concern, trust concern, uh, even, I mean, the fact that maybe uh, you will, you want, or your, your, uh, your children will, will want to, to um, that some of the information that they put uh, be, 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 be taken off. I mean, uh, a human can, I mean, for, for sometimes uh, wants to, to, to change the, the way he acts. And I think this is, this is quite important. This, this uh, incor incorporating this concern at the very beginning by design is quite important. And um, I think that uh, uh, a second answer is that we, 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 we always think that machine learning is, is an evolution process in terms of software, but based on a machine that does not change. I think that we should also think of 
embodied intelligence. So, so, so a, a machine that will evolve because, because this machine will be within the society. Uh, so, in, uh, and this makes the things even more difficult in, in the sense because you, you cannot believe that the, the machine that will, that will uh, use the software will be, always be the same. Uh, so I, I think that even in the uh, in the hardware, this concern should be uh, should be taken. So I think society is suffering more from the the fear of privacy concerns than the actual <coughs> threat, and the the irrational responses to the fear of concerns. I think one of the most helpful things we can do is to discuss privacy thoroughly, but always in a risk benefit context never in a risk-only context, because that is completely artificial. It goes right back to my first point about the biggest risk for society is to not to address that two-thirds gap in unpredicted outcomes from healthcare interventions. Many other examples can be put there. For example, the, the, the privacy around a, a piece of research that's really useful, specious privacy debate, but a blanket publishing response to lock down the whole process that led to that end published result. Now that reduces the utility of the linked data, the potentially open linked data for education, for inference that someone uh, might find that active example of transforming data <coughs> really useful in their educational context. So with all due respect, with all due respects to, to both panels who spoke about privacy, so, uh, I think that there's an incredible opportunity to do a lot in the general, for, for, for some, to address some general concerns about, about anonymizing data and making it available for studies. There's a, a number, there's a constellation of technologies coming out of computer science at the, at the intersection of computer science and policy that can go a long way. Now, I wasn't referring to privacy as being a wait and see kind of thing. That's a given. We have to address that issue. I was talking more broadly about uh, a variety, a, a constellation of future challenges we're going to have with intelligences in our midst. And I, I, you know, rather than trying to design or think ahead about those kinds of things, I'd like to sort of you know, watch them, evolve with them, and, and work with, with challenges as they come up. But I think privacy is, is something, um, even given a risk benefit and a skeptical eye to the concern about that, can be and needs to be addressed urgently. But so it's, it's a like social machine. These, it's, a not, it's not an autonomous, encapsulated entity. It's a social so, machine. So I think our time just about run out because I think people have got to catch airplanes or trains. And I won't say anything about privacy given there isn't any time. But I think we could have had the whole debate about the two questions you raised. I think ethics is important. I think people are beginning to address it. In a similar context, for example, uh, the Royal Academy of Engineering and the Academy of Medical Sciences in the UK have got together to think about cognitive enhancement. So we would all agree with the artificial cochlea, uh, enable people who can't hear to hear the work that's going on about artificial eyes and so on. What about further enhancements of cognitive capabilities? What are the ethics of providing human beings with artificial means of enhancing their cognitive capabilities? So two academies in the UK are actually at the moment sitting down together and at trying to write a joint report on this. So I think there is work going on and it is an important issue. I think we need to teach ethics to computer scientists and engineers. In our second or third year in our engineering course, we have an ethics module. Um, I think we also need interdisciplinary institutes. So the Oxford Internet Institute, only about half the people there are computer scientists. They're philosophers, they're ethicists and so on. You have to teach the non-computer scientists or the non-machine learning experts, if you want, enough about computer science and machine learning for them to be able to understand what the issues are and then to, to make a contribution. But it has to be a dialogue. So a multidisciplinary dialogue in these institutes is very important. And yes, the computer science has got to be in the middle of it, but we have to have these other branches. So I think it's something not to be swept under the carpet, but there is hope that it is being addressed. Oh, so thank you. <laughs> the last word concerning the question. I mean, uh, I just wanted to quote uh, this morning answer by Hermann Oyser uh, concerning the, uh, the fear. Uh, and uh, he was mentioning drones. And uh, remember Isaac Asimov, 
rules. One of, one of the first rules uh, concerning robots for Isaac, uh, Isaac Asimov is that robots are not allowed to kill human. Do we allow machine to kill human by design? <laughs> Great last word. Okay, yes. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, thank, let's thank the panelists. <laughs>